the people of God say amen. This truly is the day that the Lord has made, and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Is there anybody in the building tonight that's excited about being in the house of the Lord one more time? Could have been the other way. But we thank God for his goodness and his grace. Would you do me a favor and grab your neighbor's hand tonight? Let's go to God in prayer. Grab that neighbor's hand tonight. Father, we are grateful that you have given us the precious privilege to be where you are. Your word declares that the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. The word declares that you inhabit the praises of your people, that you literally sit down in the midst of whatever we are going through and dealing with, when we do not get distracted by what we see, but we embrace the reality of who you are. We are able to fall under your regency and your sovereignty, even in struggles, storms, and even in sickness. You are a very present help in the time of trouble. So God, we've gathered in this sanctuary tonight, not testifying based upon what somebody told us, but God, we know you for ourselves. You've been better to us than we could ever be to ourselves. Lord, you look beyond faults and you see every need. Yesterday's mercy wasn't good enough. So you gave us brand new mercy this morning. And God, we definitively declare tonight that brand new mercies deserve a brand new praise. We'll give you glory in this place. Now, God, as we prepare to gather around your word, our prayer is that you'll let the words of our mouth, the meditation of my heart, allow it to be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God, preach through me, preach to me, preach for me. Send the word so that your people will be edified, but in all things your name be glorified. We bless you in advance, God, for an anointing that makes preaching easy. We honor you for the treasure that you placed in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We pray it in the strong, the sacred, and the supernatural name of Jesus the Christ. Might the people of God say amen. Amen. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. We thank God for another watch that he's allowed us to gather tonight uh, to be able to share the word. We thank God for the presence of the Holy Spirit that leads and guides us all into truth. We thank God for the pastor of this people and the angel of this assembly, my friend, Pastor H. Bruce Maxwell. Lake Providence, y'all missed your cue one more time. One more time. I get to, I get to, I get to, I travel so I get to eat a lot. Uh, but when I eat, uh, uh, I eat stuff that fills me until I can get something better. If I really want to eat real good, I don't go to restaurants. I go home. Because at home, the chef knows how to give me exactly what I need. This week of revival, you're going to eat in a restaurant. But you ought to praise God for the chef that cooks every week to make sure that you get fed. Will you praise God for Pastor H. Bruce Maxwell? Amen. Lake Providence, you ought to be proud of your shepherd. And you ought to praise God for it. Amen. Bless you, sir. We thank God for your, for your hospitality and your, and your kindness to a youngin. Amen. We thank the Lord for the opportunity to share. To all the preachers who shared with us today, and to Reverend Moody and Reverend Parks from the Watson Grove Church, we thank God for you. To all of our deacons that are here with us today, and officers, members, visitors, and friends of this great branch of Zion, we greet you in the name of Jesus the Christ. I got to give a shout out to the Watson Grove family that's here tonight. If you're here tonight, would you stand? I just want to give you some love, give you a shout. Amen. I praise God for you. I thank God for you. I thank God for you, for you trusting God in me. 
Amen. Amen. If you're leading and nobody's following, you're not leading, you're taking a walk. <laughs> Amen. So we praise God for the Watson Grove Church. Amen. My lovely wife is here tonight. I praise God for her as well. My children are with her. Amen. They're hanging out tonight, able to make it tonight. Always good and grateful to have them. Our brother deacons are serving tonight. Amen. Deacons from Watson Grove. Amen. There y'all go. Y'all know my, I got the glare. I can't see. Thank God for you, sir. Thank God for you, gentlemen. They were here last night, but they got a chance to serve tonight, so we praise God for them. For all of our preachers who are here as well, thank you. God bless you. We appreciate you. Uh, certainly don't want to be before you long, but there's a word from the Lord. First Timothy chapter 1, you already heard it in your hearing. Just want to read it one more time to let it sink into your heart. Scripture tells us that we ought to meditate on the word day and night. Allow it to saturate and soak into our hearts. You know, good meat is meat that's been soaked first. Amen. 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 Sit with that thing sometimes and let it just, let it just soak. Amen. The word is the same way. First Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 12, reading from the New Living Translation, the Bible reads this way. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I persecuted his people, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All glory and honor to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Might the people of God say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I want to praise God once again as well for this choir, this choir and this music ministry, our musicians. Thank God for you. Can't take y'all nowhere. Amen. Amen. To our ushers who are serving tonight, God bless you. We thank God for you. Amen. We praise the Lord for you. Listen, I want to talk tonight with the Holy Spirit's guidance on the subject, pass it on. Pass it on. On. By now, you know I'm an interactive preacher. That means I need your help to preach. Would you do me a favor and tap the neighbor that is next to you? Tap him on the shoulder. That's the one beside you. Tap him on the shoulder. Look at him with the face. Look at him in the eye. Matter of fact, look at him like they owe you some money. Look at him good. Look at him real good. And tell him, neighbor, whatever you do, don't forget to pass it on. I've learned a few things about gratitude. Gratitude is an attitude that must be caught and or taught because greedy discontentment is the default setting for humanity. Gratitude is an attitude that must be caught or taught because greedy discontentment is the default setting for humanity. If we are not taught to appreciate what we have, we will find a way to complain about what we don't have. Nobody has to teach us to complain. We were born naturally equipped to do that. But we do have to be taught and trained on how to have gratitude. Our African ancestors understood this proclivity of human nature. Therefore, they created in every village an office called the griot. The griot's job was to learn orally the history of the people in the village. Therefore, when the next generation came along 
and they were wondering how things got to be the way that they are. And if they ever had any questions about how God had brought uh, the village and the people from one generation down to the next, they would be sent down to the griot's house. And the griot would sit them down and begin to share with them orally the history that they had memorized without any paper. They remembered what God had done, and their job was to transfer it to the next generation so that the following generation would not catch convenient amnesia and begin to think they did it by themselves. Gratitude is an attitude that must be caught or taught because greedy discontentment is the default setting for humanity. We learned this in kindergarten as well. When we came through kindergarten, uh, we had to be taught how to say please and how to say thank you because nobody had to teach us how to be greedy. Nobody had to teach us how to be selfish. Nobody had to teach us how to hog all the finger paints to ourselves. Nobody had to teach us to look up and down our knows at those classmates we were sitting next to at the cubby, but we had to be taught how to share. We had to be taught how to be kind and how to be nice and how to smile and how to share with others. Why? Because greedy discontentment is the default setting for humanity. So gratitude is an attitude that must be caught or taught. Whenever gratitude is passed from one generation down to the next, it is a beautiful thing to see. It's a wonderful thing to see grandkids and grandparents all worshiping and giving God praise because they both understand if it had not been for the Lord on their side, they'd know exactly where they would be. It is a wonderful thing to see parents and to see children praising God, worshiping, saying grace together, waking up every morning, praying together, holding devotion and appreciating the manifold blessings that God has given because that gratitude has been passed down from one generation to the next. However, if we stand the landscape of society, you and I can both testify that this level of gratitude and appreciation is not always being transferred from one generation down to the next. This is how, this is how a generation who died for the right and responsibility to vote can be followed by a generation that has the right to vote and won't use it. Because unfortunately, gratitude is not always being passed from one generation down to the next. This is how a generation of people who worked their entire lives so their children could attend school can be followed by a generation who can pick the school of their choice but will miss countless days after being suspended for something stupid. That's because gratitude is not necessarily being passed from one generation down to the next. I got to preach to myself tonight. This is how this is how a generation of people who could not even go into certain stores and in certain parts of the town yet made Christmas special every single year could be followed by a generation of people who stand in line on Black Friday, cuss, fight, and even kill each other to be first in line to spend rent money on Christmas. That's because gratitude is not being passed from one generation down to the next. Y'all don't mind if I preach it like I feel it tonight, do you? I, 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 I believe that, that, that we always got something to say about the next generation. We always have something derogatory to say and some kind of critical commentary to give to the next generation. But could it be that's how we raise them? Y'all don't like me tonight, do you? Could it be that we are, we are not appreciative for what we have, so we always complain and talk about what we don't have and what didn't go our way, and then we get an attitude when they wake up in the morning complaining just like us. We get an attitude when they don't appreciate what they have just like us. Maybe they caught it the right way. We shouted last night. I want to teach tonight. I hope you don't mind. Gra 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 gratitude has to be passed from one generation down to the next. And nobody understood this better than the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul here, here in this first letter to his son in the ministry, his son in the ministry, Timothy, is now an itinerant pastor there in the city of Ephesus. And he's writing to strengthen Timothy and to make sure he understands that, listen, you are not there because you are gifted. You are not there because you are talented. You are not there because you are so eloquent and you have the ability to extract from the word, from the law, and from the prophets. You are there simply by the grace of God. 
And Paul wants to make sure that Timothy never gets it twisted, never begins to rest on his own laurels, never begins to think that he got himself to where he is. So he makes sure in his introductory comments, in his first letter to his son, to tell him, listen, the reason you're there is because God has been good to you and you need to always be grateful for everything that the Lord allows you to experience. Can I pause for just a moment here? I need to take a survey of the house. Is there anybody in the building tonight that can testify, I'm smart, but I ain't that smart. I'm gifted, but I ain't that gifted. If God hadn't opened some doors, if God hadn't made some ways, if God hadn't turned some things around, I would not be here today. Matter of fact, matter of fact, you might want to do a row check tonight and look down your row to see if there's anybody on your pew that ain't grateful. If they are not grateful, if they got an attitude, you might want to move to another spot because you want to get connected to folk who are grateful and folk who understand it's God that got us to where we are. I digress. Pa Paul says, pa Paul says, Tim, I need you to understand that you got what you got by the grace of God. And he does not do it by looking down at, at, at Timothy and telling Timothy what he ain't doing. I wish I had time tonight. Pa Paul looks at Tim, his son in the ministry, and wants him to be grateful. But he does not sit on his pious, ped his pompous pedestal of piety and look down his nose at Tim and tell Timothy what he ain't doing right. Paul, in order to share gratitude with Timothy, begins to tell his own story. Paul, in order to make sure that Tim gets it, he doesn't talk about Tim. He said, let me show you how good God's been to me. If I want you to get this, if I want it to be contagious, you got to catch it from a grateful father. And here in the passage, Paul begins to testify, begins to almost tell on himself, begins to share with his son Timothy how grateful and how wonderful, uh, wonderfully appreciative he is for the grace that God has extended to him. If y'all don't mind tonight, I just want to walk through the passage and tiptoe through the tulips of the text to teach you some things about what it means to be grateful. Are y'all interested tonight? Here it is. Paul says, Paul says, if you're going to be grateful, if you're going to share gratitude, here's how to do it. Paul says, Tim, let me give you first an honest confession of my own weaknesses. Uh, he, 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 say, he, says, he says, Tim, before we begin the lesson on gratitude, let me show you how it starts. It starts first with an honest, somebody say honest, an honest confession of my own weaknesses. In other words, Tim, let me tell you where I struggle. <laughs> He begins, begins the passage. He, 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 says, he, says, he says, Tim, let me show you my inadequacies. Let, let, let me show you how bad off I was when the Lord found me so that you don't get some super inflated version of my story to think I ain't never done nothing wrong. Paul says, listen, let me show you my inadequacies. He says, he says, verse 12, listen, he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He said, he appointed me to do this work. Don't, don't miss that word. Don't miss that word. Pa Paul says, if I've got any ability, if I've got any strength, if I've got any power, it's only because God gave it to me. He, he, he uses the word uh, enabled in the King James Version. It means to be endued or to be filled from an external source. It means that everything, Paul says, everything I've got, Tim, that enables me to do the work and the will and follow the word of God was given to me by an external source. I didn't bring it. I wasn't capable. I didn't have enough strength. I didn't have enough wisdom. But everything I've got that I use for his glory was dropped down into me by God and by God alone. Then he says, not only did he equip me to do it, he says he appointed me to do the work. Paul says, I got appointed because I couldn't be elected. I didn't qualify. I, I, I didn't fulfill the qualifications in order to carry the office that I carry. But God saw something in me that I ain't even seeing myself and decided to give me something that was usable for the glory of God. 
Paul, Paul says, Paul says, let me show you my inadequacies. But then he says, not only do, 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 do I need to reveal my, my inadequacy, Paul says, let me now tell you and reflect on my ignorance. I didn't make it up. It's in the book, verse 13. He says, in my insolence, I persecuted God's people. He says, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and in unbelief. Listen to Paul. Paul says, not only does my ability come from God, but he says, if I have any wisdom, if I've got any insight, if I've got any revelation at all, it comes from God. Paul says, listen, before Christ, I did some stupid stuff. Can I remix it real quick? After Christ, I did some stupid stuff. But God still found a reason to use him even though he did it in ignorance and in unbelief. Paul says, I didn't know any better. I was, I was a, a zealous after the law. I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I was next in line to succeed to the Sanhedrin council. I was there when Stephen was stoned to death. They laid their coats at my feet. I was there, and I thought I was on the Lord's side. He says, I didn't know any better. Wait a minute. Time out. Paul? Bishop? Paul? Gospel, globe, triton, Paul. Apostle, Paul. Reverend, doctor, Paul. Speaking several languages all at one time. Schooled at the feet of Gamaliel. There, a Pharisee among Pharisees is now telling, I didn't know no better. Bishop Paul says, I was ignorant. I wrote 13 books of the New Testament, but I can still testify that there were some days I was ignorant. When's the last time with your saved self you sat down with somebody and told them, I remember a time when I was ignorant. I remember a time where I didn't do nothing that God told me to do, but I'm still here because his grace looked beyond my fault. So my knee. Pa Paul, Paul says, if, if we're ever really going to get people to appreciate who God is, we got to stop stacking the deck in our testimonies. If we ever want the next generation to really be appreciative of what God can do, tell the whole story. Not just the church testimony service version, but tell the whole story. Y'all sit down. Y'all make me nervous. Listen, uh, li li lying, li lying about our faults does not impress the next generation. I want to help you today. Li lying, lying about our faults does not impress them because, number one, it disconnects them from us. The next generation doesn't need to be told they jacked up. They know they jacked up. They just looking for somebody who will say, I was just as jacked up as you, but God helped me to get out of my jacked upness. But the next generation doesn't want to deal with us because we too churchy to be Christian. We act like we are the fourth part of the Trinity. We were born on a pew and we were saved and sanctified right there at the foot of the cross. We ain't never done nothing wrong, never smoked nothing, never drunk nothing, never slept with nobody we weren't supposed to sleep with, never went nowhere we weren't supposed to go. And the next generation says, I can't identify with none of that. Need some, I need a God that's real enough to deal with me and my junk at the same time. And can I tell you what the real sad problem is? The real sad problem is we've lost integrity points with the next generation because we told them our version. Then we messed around and took them to the family reunion. And they ran across Big Mama at the spade table. And Big Mama at the spade table told a whole 
whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. Now, the next generation looking at you like, oh, really? Now, I know the truth. I'm just waiting for you to tell me what the truth really is. But as long as you keep lying, I don't need your God. Paul says, we're going to share gratitude. We got to give an honest confession of our own weaknesses. But, 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 but then Paul, Paul transitions. He, he not only gives an honest confession of his own weaknesses, then, then, then Paul gives God's commitment to our wellness. In other words, Paul says, just as jacked up as I was, God was just as committed to making sure he made me usable for his service. He he says, God is serious about our success. So much so that when God saw me with my inadequacy and my ignorance, here's what God did. Paul says, God dealt with my deficiency. He says, it didn't leave me to my own devices. He met me where I was. I hear the, I hear the, the hymnologist, I came to Jesus just as I was, weary, wounded, and sad. I love the hymnologist, but, but I got to tell you, that's, that's bad theology. Because uh, uh, if I could have came to him, I would have came a long time ago. The truth is, I didn't come to him. He came to me. He found me where I was and then dealt with my deficiency. I'm in the text, verse 14. Listen to, listen to Paul. He says, oh, how gracious and generous our Lord was. Let me translate that for you. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. Somebody missed it. One more time. Oh, how generous and how gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and the love that come from Christ Jesus. When you read the Bible, make sure you read the Bible. Don't read it too fast. Listen, he says, he says, he filled me with the faith and love that only come from Christ Jesus. He filled me. The only people who can be filled are folk who will admit they're empty. The the, the only people who who can be poured in with divine stuff are those who will admit they are filled and need to be emptied first of demonic stuff. He says, he says, he filled me with grace and love. And and, 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 and the word says that that he filled me uh, uh, to the brim or or, or, or to the the lid. Really, in the King James Version, it's similar to the same word found in Ephesians 3 and 20 where it says, now unto him who was able to do exceeding abundantly. Above all we could ask or think. It's the same, it's the same term and the same phrase. So, so, so Paul says, when I came or when God came to me, I was empty. But by the time God got finished with me, not only was I filled, but I was overflowing. I, I came with nothing. I left with abundance. I I came with a minus, but I left with with excess. I came empty. I came under under the radar, but God found me, and he gave me more than I could ever imagine. He says, God dealt with my deficiency, but then God delivered without discrimination. I'm in the book, verse 15. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. There he goes again, telling the truth. Paul says, I am the worst. Paul does not spend time justifying his past. Paul instead says, I was just as jacked up as you heard I was. Probably even more. Then he goes and he grabs this this word. Uh, In the Greek, he says, "Uh, I, 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 I was the chief of sinners. That word in Greek is actually protos. It's where we get our word prototype. It means, he says, when you open up Webster's Dictionary and look up sinner in the dictionary, I'm the one, the guy waving from the the selection in the dictionary. I'm, I'm the prime example of what it means to be a sinner. Paul says, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. But here's the thing. By embracing his own past, And the depth of his wickedness, he also proves 
that God can deliver anybody. Too fast, too fast. All right. Uh, uh, by, by, by not shying away from the darkness of his own testimony, he helps others understand that you are never too far gone for God to reach down and to save you from yourself. And somebody in the next generation needs to know because every generation thinks that they are inventing new sins. Every, every, every generation, every generation thinks ain't nobody done it like we done it. We invented getting high, driving, and drunk all at the same time. I wish somebody would tell the truth and say we've been doing that for years. You talking about turn up. We used to say turn off the lights. It's all the same. It's all the same. If somebody would tell the truth, then the next generation would understand you are not too far gone for God to rescue you and to take you where he wants you to be. Paul, Paul says, we, we, we run out of time. Paul, Paul says, Paul, Paul says, Paul says, if I'm going to share my gratitude, I got to give an honest confession of my weaknesses. I've, I've got to give God's commitment to my wellness. But third and lastly, he says, now God gives an open confirmation of my worth. He, 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 he says, God took my weaknesses. He took his commitment to my wellness, mixed it all together, and somehow good and bad connected bring glory to God. He says, I don't even understand how it works. But, 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 but somehow he took my mess, put it in his miraculous hands, whipped it, turned it, put it through some time of process of grace and mercy. And before you know it, now I stand here today as a demonstration of what God is able to do. The good thing about this is when God does this kind of transformation, he never wants to do it on the low. He always wants to do it on the front page. He always wants to resurrect you in the place where you got crucified. He always wants to lift you up in the place where you thought you were going to die. He always pulls you out and turns you into a trophy of his love and his mercy in the same place where other folks said you'd never make it back. I'm in the book. I'm in the book. Verse 16 says, God had mercy on me. So, so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience. Pa Paul says, here's what God did. God, God, God is so gangster with his, here's what he did. He, he, he rescued me in Damascus, turned me around, got me anointed by Ananias, where I received the Holy Spirit and scales fell from my eyes. And God, with his divine sense of humor, sent me right back to Jerusalem. The same place that I sat on the Sanhedrin council, the same place where I used to persecute believers. He sent me to the same spot where folk knew me back when. Matter of fact, when I got there, the believers didn't even believe I was who I said I was. Barnabas had to vouch for me in order for me to even be accepted amongst the believers because folk knew me well when I was out there. But it didn't take long for them to discover something had got a hold of me. I wasn't, I wasn't the same. I, I, I didn't talk the same. I didn't move the same. I didn't act the same. Somehow, uh, uh, the, the, the bitterness and the anger that was rappling and, and wrestling away my heart got rescued and transplanted with the love of Jesus Christ. And now the same people I used to want to kill are the same folk he's got me leading, planting churches all over Asia Minor. God, God, God. Paul says when God does it right, he does it right. He gives you an open confirmation of his worth. I'm done. I'm done. Paul, Paul, Paul says, Paul says, let me show you my gratitude. Uh, not, not, not just in words, but in deeds. He says, he says, God, uh, God, 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 God loved me so much, so much that, 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 that he looked beyond my obvious weaknesses and began to use me for his glory. He said, I gave him an honest confession of my weaknesses. He says, I gave you God's commitment to my wellness, and but now I'm beginning to share you how God has confirmed my worth in spite of what I went through. And Paul gets the verse 17. And before you know it, Paul gets a case of the can't help it. Paul, 
Paul gets to verse 17, and, and he loses it for a moment. L listen to Paul. He says, all honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Wait a minute, Paul. Pa pa Paul goes into uh, what theologians called a doxology. Now, Paul is known for doxologies, but doxologies usually come at the end of a chapter. They usually come at the end of a book, at the end of a letter, when he's closing out and trying to share his gratitude. He ain't even got through the first chapter yet. But he started to reminisce and think about how good God had been. He, he, he started to, to recall and reflect on how gracious God had been, and he didn't worry about the letter no more. He broke right into a praise. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He's the, the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Amen. I wondered, wondered why, why now would he throw a doxology? in the middle of the letter. I discovered something, something uh, uh, about doxologies. When, when, whenever, whenever you have good theology, it's going to always lead to a great doxology. Okay, uh, uh, the Theology is thinking about God. Doxology is thanking God for what you just thought about. Whenever you think about how good God has been, and you've got a connection to your own testimony. Something in you almost can't help itself and begins to remember and to thank God for the grace that he shared. Hy hymnologists do this better than anybody I know. Uh, 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 let's see, see, see if I can help you. Uh, uh, theology. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. Hold on. Doxology. My soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. Whenever you got good theology, it's always going to lead to a great doxology. Uh, the the theology. Uh, uh, oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider the world thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed doxology, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. When, when, whenever, whenever you got good doxology, theology is going to lead to a great doxology. Let me see, see if I can help you. Uh, uh, the theology, down at the cross where my Savior died, down where from cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Hold on, doxology. Glory to his name. Okay, so, some of y'all ain't caught it yet. See, see, see if I can help you. There's, there's a story, there's a story, there's a story of, of a preacher uh, from down in Texas. Preacher from down in Texas, and, and this preacher uh, uh, had a seven-year-old daughter. A seven-year-old daughter who was, who was highly curious and loved her father, but she always paid attention to whenever her father preached a message. And, and, and she noticed that whenever her daddy began to close his messages, he would close the message the exact same way. It didn't matter if he was preaching about Jesus or whether he was preaching about John. He might have been preaching about Moses or talking about David. Whenever he got to the end of his sermon, he would close the sermon the exact same way. He would throw his head back, throw his jacket behind him, get in to his preacher's stance and say, I no, he's all right. Didn't matter what he was preaching about. Every time he got to the celebration part of the message, he would throw his head back, throw his jacket behind him, get in his preacher's stance and say, I know he's all right. 
Well, that baby girl got real curious. And one day at the house, she came to her daddy and said, Daddy, can I ask you a few questions? She said, why in the world do you close every sermon the same way? Daddy got excited. He said, baby girl, sit down on my knee in the chair and let me testify to you why I testify and close the same way every time. He said, baby girl, do you see the house that we live in today? We've got a lot of bedrooms and a whole lot of square footage, but back in the day, it was not always just like this. I can remember when we had a two-bedroom apartment. That's all we could afford. Couldn't get away from one another, so we used to fight in the same room. But now, look at what God has done. That's why I say I know he's all right. He said, baby girl, do you see the cars that are in the driveway today? I can remember when all we had was a broke down hoop ride. Had to get it fixed every Saturday just so we could go to church on Sunday. But look at what the Lord has done. That's why I say I know he's all right. He said, baby girl, do you see the suits that your daddy wears on Sunday? It wasn't always like that. Today I can wear gaiters and I got custom made three pieces. But I can remember when all my suits were hand-me-downs. I had patches in the elbows and patches in the knees because that's all that my daddy could afford. But he gave me the best that he cared. And now, when I remember what I used to wear, I throw my head back, throw my jacket behind me, and say, I no, he's all right. He said, baby girl, it's not just material, but I can remember the time. Do you see your mama standing there in the kitchen with her fine self? Not too long ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. They didn't think she'd survive the disease, but three years later, she's in full remission. Her hair's come back. She's not in a wheelchair no more. Every time I look at your mama, I say, I know he's all right. He said, baby girl, you don't even know your story. You are seven years old. You're sharp and smart as a whip. But I remember when you were first born, you were three months premature. Your heart was not developed. Your lungs needed help. And no and make it past one year. But look at you now, seven years old, inquisitive as ever. That's why I say I know he's all right. Until that day, the baby girl didn't know the story. And she just thought daddy was being preachy. But after daddy passed on gratitude down to that baby girl, she understands why daddy acts the way he acts. Daddy stands up in the lazy boy chair and the baby girl gets down. He's got tears all in his eyes because he's remembering where the Lord brought him from. The girl gets up, walks over to the door, turns around, looks at her daddy. She's got tears all in her eyes. And she says, Daddy, Daddy said what, baby girl? She gets in her preacher stance, throws her head back, throws her dress behind her, and says, I know he's all right. I got to get out of here. But is there anybody that's grateful tonight? I said, is there anybody that'll tell him thank you? Did he wake you up this morning? building the night that'll 
to give him a praise. Open up your mouth. Lift your hands and say, I know he's all.